You're listening to audio from Cities Church. You can find more resources and learn about our ministry by visiting citieschurch.com. So here in the month of August, uh, we as a church are hitting reset. And I want to go ahead and just remind you here right from the start um, about the foundation that we're coming back to. This is the, the, uh, the organizing principle or the premise that I mentioned last week. This is what we're coming back to that I, I'm praying is going to snap us back to reality and give us a fresh vision for what God has for us. This is how it, how it goes. The more we are assured of God's love and of how much we don't deserve it, then the more we are humbled and filled with joy, then the more we are poured out in love for others, which all amounts to magnifying the glory of God. And so... Last week, we talked about the love of God, and we looked at 1 John 4, where the Bible tells us that God is love. God's love is demonstrated and deep and determined, and we know that God's love changes us. In fact, the more we comprehend God's love for us, then the more we will be changed. That's a, that's a foundational conviction uh, here in this reset that we're doing. And just to be clear, that conviction is from the Bible. All right. The clearest place that I think we see it is in Ephesians chapter three, um, which uh, Kyle just quoted from. In Ephesians chapter three, the apostle Paul has been writing about the eternal purposes of God that are realized in Jesus. And then in verse 14, he moves into a prayer And he begins to tell the church what he is praying for them. So Paul says he's asking God to strengthen the church so that Jesus would dwell in their hearts by faith. He's asking God, by your spirit, strengthen the church so that Jesus dwells in their hearts by faith. And then he explains what that means. Jesus dwelling in our hearts means that we are rooted and grounded in love. And being rooted and grounded in love, we have strength to comprehend every dimension of God's love for us in Jesus. That's Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19. Paul wants us to know more deeply the love of God that surpasses knowledge. That's what he prays for us. That's what the Apostle Paul is asking God to do in the church, which includes our church, includes us. And so maybe, as I was thinking about this, you know, there's probably a lot of us in here who have heard about Ephesians 3 before. Maybe we know. We've read it before. We've heard it before. We know that Paul has prayed for us to comprehend every dimension of God's love. This is not new for us. We've seen it before. And yet, if that is the case for us, if we've heard this before, which I know is true for many of us, why then haven't we taken God up on this? The Apostle Paul has prayed to God And he has asked God, Paul has asked God to make me know more of God's love in Jesus. So then, why don't I come to God more often expecting God to answer that prayer? I mean, do I think that the Apostle Paul is wrong here in what he prays? Or... Do I think that God is not able to answer this prayer? Which is it? It has to be one of the other, right? Why don't I, why don't we come to God like Ephesians 3 could be true of us? We've heard it before. We know what Paul prays. Why don't we come to God expecting him to answer that prayer? Ephesians 3 is not a pipe dream. This is a prayer, and this is a good prayer. The Apostle Paul is praying a good prayer here, and God is good and strong enough to answer this prayer. So therefore, I am living with a new expectation. I hope you will too. But part of this reset is that I'm living with a new expectation. Expecting God 
to answer this prayer in Ephesians 3. I don't know all the details of what people want in their pastor. I don't know. But I can tell you the kind of pastor I want to be. I want to be an expert in the love of God. And Paul prayed that I would be. And he prayed the same thing for you. So let's pray that together this morning as we get started. Father Almighty, you are the maker of heaven and of earth and of everything. And so right now in this moment, we are asking together. We are asking with the Apostle Paul for you to indeed strengthen us by your Holy Spirit to know more of your love for us in Jesus. We mean that. Like right now, we mean that prayer. There is more wonder and depth and glory in your love than we currently understand. So, Father, give us more understanding. Make us know more of your love, even today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the more we are assured of God's love and of how much we don't deserve it, the more we're going to be changed. And we're going to be changed how? Well, I'm saying that we're going to be changed by being humbled and filled with joy. And those are virtues. Humility and joy are character traits that mark the Christian life, and they are both commanded in the New Testament. We should walk in humility, and we should rejoice. And the reason that I am highlighting these virtues over other virtues like like patience or kindness is because I think humility and joy are are broader fundamental virtues. These these, These virtues are kind of like the soil in which all the other virtues grow, and that's because these virtues, humility and joy, are at the heart of our identity. And that's what 1 John 3 is is all about. So if you have your Bible, open there to 1 John 3. We just heard it read. Look at verse 1. 1 John 3, verse 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. So John here, he is telling the church who we are. We are children of God. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean to be children of God? Well, I think in this passage, we we see it means at least three things, okay? Being children of God means, one, we are loved by God, right here. Two, we look like Jesus. And then three, we live in hope. Loved by God, look like Jesus, Live in hope. These are the the three points of the sermon. This is the outline and the plan. I'm just going to work through each of these, starting here with the first. The children of God are loved by God. And we can see this right there in verse 1. John says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us. And by see, he means to understand. So John, like Paul, wants us to understand God's love. And he says that we can understand God's love in the fact that we are called children of God. So last week, we saw how John explains the love of God. God's love is demonstrated in the death of Jesus. John says, this is how we know it's love. It's not that we love God, but that God loved us, and he sent his son to die for us. That is the love of God we saw last week. And here in chapter 3, John says that we can understand more of what that love means by remembering who we are. So think about it like this. There's the love of God and what the love of God has done. And then there is who we are because of the love of God. God makes us his children. Out of his love, God makes us his children. We are the children of God, which means we are loved by God as his sons and daughters. And let me just say, that's not going to mean anything to you 
if you think that every human being is a child of God. I know that's kind of a popular idea, this idea that every person in the world is a child of God. But here, here's, the, here's the problem with that. It only works if it stays very generic. When there's a generic God with a generic love, then you can have a world full of generic children. But that's just not the way the Bible puts it. In the Bible, the love that God has for his children is a particular kind of love. It's a love that is given to us as a gift, not love that we are entitled to. In fact, when it comes to what we're entitled to, when it comes to our destiny as sinful humans, the Bible says very clearly it is the judgment of God. This is in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. Paul's talking there about who we used to be apart from Jesus. And he says that in our sin, apart from faith in Jesus, we were by nature children of wrath, just like the rest of mankind. That is who we used to be. Our inheritance as sinful humans is God's wrath, which includes everybody apart from Jesus. Apart from Jesus, you are not a child of God. You are a child of wrath. But, but, there is God in his love. And because of God's great love for us, this is Ephesians 2, 4, because of God's great love for us, he makes us alive in Christ. God takes dead people in their sins, people dead in their sins. He takes children of wrath and he makes them his own children. And the Apostle John talks about this in the Gospel of John. It's in the very first chapter, chapter 1, verse 12. This is what John says there. He says, but to all who receive Jesus, to all who believe in Jesus, God gave them the right to become children of God. And listen to this. Children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Children of wrath become children of God when they believe in Jesus, and God is the one who makes that happen. We can't do it. We can't make that happen. This is the work of God. And when you believe in Jesus, when you put your faith in Jesus, you become a child of God. God makes that your right. That is who you become. And there's more. I love the way that John says it here in 1 John 3, 1. Hear this again in verse 1. Verse 1. 1 John 3, 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. I think John is highlighting something important here. Notice he says that we are called the children of God and we are the children of God. Being called something and being something are not the same. Sometimes people are called things they are not, and then sometimes people are things they are not called. One is to flatter, and the other is to disown. One is to overspeak, and the other is to underspeak, but God will do neither. With God, there is a perfect, perfect congruence between his word and reality. With God, he calls it as it is, and what he calls is. So, if he calls you his child, you are his child. And if you are his child, he calls you his child. And I wonder what you think about that. I, I wonder, have you... Thought, spend time, have you spent time thinking about what does it mean to be a child of God? What does it mean that God calls me his child? Like, I want us to feel this at the heart level, okay? Um, 
You as a child of a child of God, you as a child of God, it does not mean that you are just part of the family tree. It, it does not mean that you're just somewhere on the map, somewhere down the line. It does not mean that you have some kind of connection to God as if you were just a distant great great grandchild. Okay, get this. There is one mediator between God and man, and it's Jesus. And when you put your faith in Jesus, you are a child of God, and God calls you child. So stop living like a great, great, great grandchild and start living like a child. Do you get it? Live like you are a child of God because you are. And because you are a child of God, because we who trust in Jesus are children of God, God says about us the same thing he says about Jesus. And we know what he says about Jesus in Matthew 3.17. He says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. This is the son whom I love and I am happy with him. And if you trust in Jesus. You are a child of God, and God says the same thing about you. Brothers and sisters, sons and daughters of God, we are the children of God, and we are loved by God. It's one, here's two. We're not just loved by God. We look like Jesus. This is verse 2, 1 John 3. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. John is talking about Jesus here, and he says that at the second coming of Jesus, when Jesus returns, we are going to be like him. We are going to be resurrected into a glorified body and that glorified body is going to resemble Jesus. That is the completion of our salvation. Every Christian will be perfectly Christ-like. And this is something that's going to happen in a moment. The Apostle Paul says it's going to happen in the twinkling of an eye like that. And it's something that is already at work in our lives right now. It will happen in a moment, and it's already happening Right now, because in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says that right now, as in today, as in this moment, right now, we as Christians, as those who trust in Jesus, as the children of God, we are being transformed from one degree of glory to another. Transformed into what? Transformed into the image of Jesus. So God, after God makes us his children, he continues to work in our lives. This is what is usually called sanctification. And the goal of sanctification, what God is doing in your life right now, Christian, is that he is making you look more like Jesus. That's what it means to be a child of God. It means that, that you look more and more like Jesus. You're going to keep looking more and more like Jesus until one day when Jesus returns, you will perfectly look like Jesus. And... Uh, the reason, you've maybe seen passages like this before. The, the, the reason the New Testament talks about Jesus as the firstborn among many brothers is because he is the first among many who will be like him. We're being made, conformed, transformed into his image. I, I love the way the book of Hebrews puts it. The book of he Hebrews says that Jesus is the founder and the perfecter of our faith. Jesus is the one who has gone before us. He's the one who has walked the path ahead of us, and we are following in his steps, being transformed more and more into his image. And, and I love the way the most glorious passage, I think, on this topic of sanctification is in Hebrews chapter 2, and it's in verses 10 to 11. And I, I want, I'm going to read the passage for you, and I want you, just, I want you to hear it, okay? So, there are some pronouns in the passage that I'm just going to replace um, with, some, with some names so that you know who I'm talking about. But this passage, just let, hear this passage on sanctification in Hebrews chapter 2. All right, listen to this. This is beginning of verse 10. For it was fitting that God the Father, for whom and by whom all things exist, 
and bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For Jesus, the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source, which is God the Father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to point out the obvious here in this passage. If God is your father, that makes Jesus your brother. Okay? I'm not sure we, we thought about that before. If Jesus is the son of God, and he is, if Jesus is the son of God, and we are the children of God, then that makes Jesus our brother. And it gets better than that because here in Hebrews chapter 2, Jesus is not ashamed to be your brother. That's what Hebrews chapter 2 verse 11 says. Jesus is not ashamed of you. Jesus is not ashamed of you. And if he's not ashamed of you, then what does that mean? This is like an honest question moment, okay? What does it mean? If Jesus is not ashamed of you, if Jesus is not ashamed of you, then what is he? And I realize that what I'm about to say, it, it might sound weird and it might, it might come off strange. And as I was meditating through these things, I debated whether, whether I should say this or not because I don't want it to be misunderstood and I don't want it to be taken out of context, but I do want us to feel, I want us to feel the word of God here in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11. And what the Bible says here is this. Women in this room, daughters of God in this room, Jesus is proud to call you his sister. Men in this room, sons of God in this room. Jesus is proud to call you his brother. And you all look like him. And he is making you every day more and more. He is making you to look more like him. That is what holiness means. That is what repentance is all about. Because we are children of God, because we look like Jesus and are being made to look more like Jesus, sin becomes a contradiction to our identity. It's not who we are. And so we kill our sin to live in Christ. We put off the old self and we put on the new self. The holy life is the life that resembles Jesus. And next week, we're going to talk about what that life does. But for today, for this week, you need to know that's who you are. Child of God, daughter of God, son of God. That's who you are. As children of God, we are being conformed into the image of Jesus. The children of God look like Jesus. It's right here. Last point, number three. The children of God live in hope. There's a connection between the future God has for us and the way we live right now, and that connection is what we call hope. In 1 John 3, right after John mentions the return of Jesus, um, when, when we're, we're going to be perfectly like him, after John mentions that, he says in verse 3, And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. In other words, our hope in Jesus and becoming like Jesus is what makes us holy. We become like Jesus by hoping in Jesus. This is when the reality of what we will be in the future reaches back into our present and changes us. That's the way God wants us to live. And it's so important. God wants us to live this way. And it's so important that he gives us the Holy Spirit to help us do this. The Holy Spirit is the minister of hope in our lives. And do you know what the Spirit does? 
Do you know what the Holy Spirit does to give us hope? What is the hope that the Holy Spirit gives to us? Another way to say it, what is the Holy Spirit bearing witness to when it comes to our spirits? What is the Holy Spirit testifying to us? We are the children of God. And one day, we are going to look perfectly like Jesus. This is Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, verse 15, this is what Paul says. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. God has a future for us. He has an inheritance for us. We are fellow heirs with Jesus. That is our hope. That is our hope. And so how do we live in this hope? It means that we live like what will be more fully realized in the future can be more truly realized today because it's true today. I'm going to say that again. Living in hope, living in hope, living in hope means that we live like what will be more fully realized in the future can be more truly realized today because it is true today. One day in the future, it will be revealed and made crystal clear to the whole entire world that you are a child of God. But you don't become a child of God then. Beloved, we are God's children now. We are God's children now. And so we live like it. Now, and that means we go about our days from place to place and moment to moment like we have a Father in heaven who loves us. It means that whatever, wherever, whenever we find ourselves in hard places, whenever our circumstances are painful, we know that our Father in heaven is in control and that he's not surprised by anything and that he only intends our everlasting good and he will affect our everlasting good no matter what. It means that every detail we know every detail in our lives is under the care of our father and somehow in some way by his wisdom our father who loves us is working out every detail for our joy we live like that and if we want to get more practical and we do want to get more practical living in that kind of hope emanates character Living in that kind of hope expresses itself in virtues. And those virtues are humility and joy. The more we are assured of God's love and of how much we don't deserve it, the more we are humbled and filled with joy. That God loves me. He loves me. That God loves me. That the God of Abraham is my father. That the creator of the universe calls me his child. Like, I don't know whether to fall down in silence or to jump up and sing, right? When we are letting this truth wash over us, we don't know whether to put our hands over our mouth, stunned in awe, or to raise our hands in the air in adoration and praise. We don't know. We're humbled and we're filled with joy, and we don't know what to do with ourselves because that's what the love of God does. It humbles us. The love of God humbles us, and it fills us with joy. We are profoundly grateful. And we are pervasively glad. And I want so badly to live that way. Like, I want church. I want us so badly to live that way. Profoundly grateful, pervasively glad. I am humbled. God loves me. 
I'm humble and I'm filled with joy. I am filled with joy. My son Micah, who is seven, um, he's, he's had an eventful summer. About a month ago, just over here in the bathroom, uh, he, he mashed his, his fingers uh, in the hinge of the door, and uh, he's, uh, he's doing the process of lose, losing a couple fingernails there. And, and then the very next day after that, he was playing outside, and he, he fell and gashed his knee open. And so that afternoon um, when he, he did that, I took him uh, to the ER down at, at Children's, the, the children's ER, because he needed to get some stitches. And so we went, and I don't know um, the last time that um, any of you have been to the ER, but it's kind of a, I guess, a standard procedure that they ask you to rate your pain on a pain chart, right? You guys know how this works. Now, for adults, I assume that a numerical chart, like 1 to 10, works fine. But for kids, it's like a, it's an emoji chart, all right? And so, there, you know, it, when it, it, the way the, the chart works is that um, there's, there's a really big smiley face if you don't have any pain. And then there's this really dreadful sad face for the most intense pain. Those, those are the extremes. And so we're at the ER, and, you know, they took us back, and they asked Micah, which face looks like how you feel? And before I could explain to Micah how it all works, um, he chose the big smiley face. And, and uh, they sent us back to the waiting area, and four and a half hours later, they called us back, and he got the stitches, and we got home around midnight. Uh, and during that four-hour time as we were waiting, um, I was explaining to Micah, I, I was kind of just telling him, hey, you know, if, if the pain was really bad, then they would have seen you sooner. But... I hope this is okay, all right, for you medical professionals out there. But, but because you chose the big smiley face, we got bumped to the bottom of the list. And so, buddy, look, the next time you're in the ER, if you don't want to wait four and a half hours, don't pick the big smiley face. Pick the sad, dreadful face. And I was sort of joking with him, you know. I, sort of. I mean, it, it, we waited a long time, and he was in pain. He was in pain. Um, well, this past Thursday, Micah was playing outside again, and uh, he fell, and he cracked his arm. And uh, he's just, he just, no banana suit or anything like that. He, he just fell and cracked his arm. And, and so Melissa took him to the urgent care for an x-ray. And as they were there, and they were trying to figure out how bad this fracture was, the nurse uh, comes to Melissa, and she tells Melissa, he probably just needs to go into the children's ER. And, and Melissa tells me this later, but you know, Mike is sitting there, and he hears the nurse say this. He hears the nurse say he needs to go to the ER, and so he's quiet for a minute, and you know, he's sitting there with his arm splinted up, and then he, um, he tells Melissa, he says, well, Mom, I know what Dad's going to say, but I'm still going to choose that big smiley face. There are a lot of times in life when we are rightfully sad. That is part of what it means to live in a world of suffering and hardship. There are dark and terrible valleys that God brings us through. And I know that some of you are walking through those valleys right now. And I want you to know that even in those valleys, even in your suffering, you can have joy. You can. You can have joy. Because even at the rock bottom, down to the core, there at the root, when everything else fades or falls or is taken away, you are still a child of God. At the rock bottom, no matter what comes your way, no matter what happens at the rock bottom, you can smile because God, your Father, smiles on you. You can. You can smile. Because, child of God, you are loved by God. Child of God, you look like Jesus. Children of God, we can live in hope. 
And that is what this table reminds us every single week. The table is a gift that Jesus has given his church so that we can remember each week the greatness of God's love. And the way that the way the table reminds us of God's greatness is it reminds us that Jesus died for us. That's how we're reminded of the greatness of God's love. Jesus died for you. This table brings us back to the cross where Jesus died for the children of God who through faith in Jesus become the children of God. And so all that I've said, I just want to be clear, all that I've said today does not apply to you apart from Jesus. The love of God, all that I've said about the love of God does not apply to you apart from Jesus. It just does not. But in Jesus, by faith in Jesus, you are called a child of God. You are a child of God. And so, sons and daughters of God, this bread and this cup is for you. And so that's who you are. I invite you to eat and to drink with us this morning. We want to serve the bread first and then just hold on to it. I'll come back up and we'll eat it all together. His body is the true bread. Let us serve you.